I literally just played, you know, the movie, the Interstellar hadn't come out. And I go, it's not a big part, but I am a guy alone on a planet, you know, and I don't know if I should follow it up with the guy who's alone on a planet. Really, nobody gives a shit about that. <laughs> Good Will Hunting. And that movie is so much of my 20s and Ben Affleck's 20s, like we wrote that together and just the whole story of getting it made was one whole thing, but then once we got it made, to have Robin sign up to do it was really, that's really what got us a green light. And, and I just have so many memories of that guy. He changed our lives and he, and he couldn't have been more gracious, more hardworking. As writers, like he was a guy who could come in and just throw lines out. For instance, the last line of that movie, he reads a letter from me and he says, son of a bitch, he stole my line. That wasn't scripted, Robin just did that. We had scripted that he just kind of sits there and takes it in and realizes that my character's gone and he didn't say anything. He just kind of took that moment. And the one that's in the movie, he just said, Son of a bitch, he stole my line. And I was with Gus Van Sant, the director. We were both next to the camera, and I remember grabbing him like this, like shaking him like, because we knew that was it the second he said it. And then we probably did 10 more takes after that, because Robin would just go until he literally had mined everything in that beautiful brain of his. Yeah, he just was a really special guy. Sean, if the professor calls about that job, just tell him, sorry. I had to go see about a girl. Well, son of a bitch, he stole my life. We wrote that movie specifically, Ben and I wrote it because we wanted the parts as actors. And at the time, there was a really popular movie that we all loved called Reservoir Dogs, Quentin Tarantino's first movie. And the story we had heard was that because Harvey Keitel signed up for the movie, Quentin got, I think it was half a million dollars. That was his budget and he could make the movie. And so we wrote that part that Robin eventually took. We called it the Harvey Keitel part, looking for an actor who could get us money because Ben and I wanted to star in the movie and we knew we were worth nothing. So we needed to get somebody. And we wrote it really open-ended. You know, we wrote it, okay, they're from the same neighborhood, so they kind of understand each other. But we also knew we could adjust it if, if Morgan Freeman or somebody like Denzel Washington wanted to come in and play it, we could make that character from Roxbury and like kind of explore the kind of historic racial tension in Boston. If Meryl Streep took the part, we could, instead of a father-son relationship, it would be a mother-son relationship. So we really left it open um, because we wanted to cast as wide a net as possible because we just were trying to get the movie made. We went from literally the year before, Billy Crystal was hosting the Oscars and we were shooting Goodwill Hunting in Toronto and we were watching it on TV at the, our little condo. So the whole cast was betting on who they thought would win and Gus Van Sant, the director, was with us and we just kind of, you know, on our couch watching the Oscars. And from that, we went to the very next year sitting in the front row and Billy Crystal in the, in the medley that he would, the musical number that he would open the show with actually started to sing about Ben and me and it was just completely surreal. It took years to kind of process what happened that night. It was utterly surreal. Saving Private Ryan. Right? It was one better than that. He didn't make me go to boot camp separately. He made me not go to boot camp so that the other guys would resent me. <laughs> so they all went through this kind of experience and they all bonded. But because I was the character they were looking for and they resented this guy that they were risking their lives to go find, Stephen purposely kept me away from them and let them know that I hadn't been made to go to boot camp. They're a very tight kind of cohesive unit. I'm an outsider who they they resent. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense, sir. Why? Why me? Why do I deserve to go? Why not any of these guys? They all fought just as hard as me. Is that what they're supposed to tell your mother? When they send her another folded American flag? Tell her that when you found me, I was here, and I was with the only brothers that I have left, and that there's no way I was gonna desert them. I got that part, going back to Robin Williams. When we were in Boston, we were rehearsing for Goodwill Hunting, and Spielberg came in because he was shooting Amistad, and he was shooting a scene with Anthony Hopkins at the Capitol, and it was, you know, across Boston Commons from where we were rehearsing. 
And Robin took Ben and me to meet Steven because he knew it was never a bad thing to meet like, you know, the greatest filmmaker of all time and, and how much we'd appreciate that. And I had put myself on tape and I had read for Private Ryan and I'd, I hadn't been cast. He met me in person and he said, I think I know you from somewhere. And I said, well, I did this movie called Courage Under Fire. And he goes, that's the one. He goes, you know, that's funny. I said to my wife, that's the exact type of person I'd want to play Private Ryan, but he's too, he's too thin because I'd lost 40 pounds to, because I was playing a heroin addict in Courage Under Fire. And so it was only because Robin introduced me to him that he went, oh, okay, no, you're, 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 kind of, you're the kind of guy I'm looking for for that job. So Robin not only got our dream in Goodwill Hunting made, he actually got me the role in Saving Private Ryan as well, in a way. The Talented Mr. Ripley. Patricia Highsmith wrote a character that's very different than the one that, in Anthony's version of The Talented Mr. Ripley. Her take on it was, when you read those books, you're enjoying the fact that he's killing these people and these people are very kind of two-dimensional. And Anthony thought it was a lot more interesting if you made it about these people who were three-dimensional rather than kind of hating them and, and being a total sociopath was somebody who just wanted to belong and had his nose pressed up against the glass. And it was a completely different take than I expected even going into it. Anthony just had a great love for all of his characters and I think that comes across in the movie. I haven't seen that movie in a long time but it, it seems to be the one of the ones that lasted. Dickie Greenleaf? Who's that? It's Tom. Tom Ripley. Tom Ripley? We were at Princeton together. Okay. Did we know each other? Hello. Uh, well, I knew you, so I suppose you must have known me. And we shot that movie for $37 million, which was not a lot of money for that movie. John Seal was the cinematographer. It required every department just really, really pushing to kind of the limit of what could be done for it to look that good and for us to shoot it that fast. And we, it was six day weeks every week. I remember Sundays was just, we'd all just sleep. So we could just be ready for Monday morning because it was a marathon. I was tasked with like trying to look like Jude Law, which meant that every day I came home from work and I got on a treadmill when I ran six miles. <laughs> they rented me this beautiful palazzo. I needed a treadmill, and the only treadmill at the time in, in, in Rome was at the, at the Hilton. And so I moved kind of out of town up on the hill to the Hilton Cavalieri, which was kind of lonely, which was good for the part. But, you know, you're in Rome. Who wants to, who wants to live at the Hilton, right? Who are you to say anything to me? Who are you to tell me anything? Actually, I really, really do not want to be on this boat with you. I can't move without shut you up. moving. Shut up. Gives me the creeps. You give me the creeps. You can't you move shut without up. dicky, 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 like a little girl all the time. Shut up. Oh. That's a prosthetic gag because what Anthony wanted was was the hit and a quick exchange of dialogue and then for the blood to start. And so I remember Jude getting up at like two or three in the morning to go before everybody with the makeup team and they built this thing on his face that was very fragile. So I'm, I'm sure we would have shot probably the bulk of the scene the day before, you know, because it's a pretty intense scene on the boat between the two of us. When you do something like that, you're walking around with wires attached to you and like, it's like nobody touch him, you know, and it's like everything is get Jude onto the boat, get him where he needs to be, you know, and then everybody get ready, be in position and, you know, three, two, one, boom, and then the thing opens and then you have to take it all off and then you just put blood on him and then we carry on with the scene. And so it, we would have shot that over a couple days. The Oceans Trilogy. Yeah, well, the, the trick to those movies is it's supposed to look kind of tossed off and nonchalant and all of that, but it's very highly choreographed. The cast, because we were all used to kind of headlining movies and, and carrying them and all that responsibility and pressure, and you work, you're in every shot every day, and suddenly, you know, you're working two or three or four days a week, which was unheard of. Steven had the real heavy lifting. Steven's job was to do, you know, try to keep 11 storylines going, try to keep the you know, the, the right rhythm and pace to it, you know, they have to be fun, you know, but the heist has to, the, that gag has, that, that all has to kind of work. And so I remember riding up to, in the elevator with him one night, we were in Las Vegas and I said, are you going to play any, any blackjack while you're here? And he goes, I have one big bet. It's like a hundred million dollar bet. And, and I don't have time for anything else. Like this is the only thing I'm, I'm focused on. Oh, let the sun beat down upon my face stars to fill my dreams i am a traveler in both time and space to be where i have been hey, 
I don't even understand what happened in there. What did I say? You called his niece a whore. A very cheap one. What? She's seven. I'm currently confined to bed with a wicked oh, case. No, don't, don't, don't tell me that. I'm sorry. Okay. So what does this mean? It means you stay here. Well, we rarely kept a straight face. I mean, what's in the movie are the takes where we didn't kind of fall out laughing because we were pretty unprofessional. Steven used to complain. He was like the teacher trying to keep everybody in line. But, but we just had so much fun together and it was such a good group. There was no ego on those sets. If you were the last person to get to set, you know, because you, you all get called at the same time. And the last person invariably got a round of applause, like standing ovation from everyone else. Even if you're like two minutes early to set, like if you're the last one, so kind of the opposite of what you might expect in a situation where ego could get involved. It just never happened. The Bourne franchise. When I signed up for the first one, I signed up for one. It's like, well, if the first one works, you have to do two more. I don't think anybody thought it would work. So they were like, no, one's fine. We went over schedule on that movie. And that's always a bad kind of indicator. Usually it means the film's in trouble. You know, 9-11 happened like while we were in post-production. And so the movie ended up coming out, I think a year after it was supposed to come out. None of us were anticipating it being a, in fact, it opened against two big movies, Scooby-Doo which sounds, you know, silly in retrospect, but those movies are, you know, they, they find a very big audience. And Wind Talkers, there was a Nick Cage movie that was coming out that was a big budget movie, bigger, much bigger than us. And all three of those movies were opening on the same Friday. We were just hoping that, you know, we could kind of make a little dent. I still remember because the Scooby-Doo made $54 million that weekend and we made 27, which was a lot more. So we made exactly half. It completely outperformed what we thought. And then the reason that we ended up making a sequel was because it was one of those movies that because it hadn't been driven down anybody's throat, because no one really thought it would be a hit, audiences kind of found it on their own. So every week it overperformed what they projected. And that was only because moviegoers were, were, were going, hey, you should go check this one out. It's good. And, uh, and that, was, that was kind of how that kind of became our thing. It was like the, the, the moviegoers made that franchise. I really went as deep as I could on the choreography for the fighting was because I'd never done an action movie because people didn't think of me as an action person and I didn't either and I really wanted to do everything that I could to be as believable as possible. In terms of the stunts, I always defer to the stunt team because they're great and they, if, if it's safe enough for you to do, they're, they'll train you up so that you can do it. Those guys just take over and, and they're amazing. And you can't tell when it's me and when it's not because they're, they're that good. But I always try to do as much as I can just because you can hold a shot longer. I mean, nowadays with face replacement, you could probably do anything. But back then, you could hold a fight scene longer. And if you got all of the moves right, you can do 15, 20 moves. And, and you're like, holy shit, that's that's the actor, like the, the actor's really doing that. I did boxing training and martial arts training and all this stuff in the run up to that movie because I wanted to try to help the movie as much as I could and, and, and extend some of those shots. The Departed. It was in Boston, so I was really uh, kind of relaxed and, and, you know, I mean, I just knew that world. Mark, obviously, too, no, really knows that world. And I remember we were shooting Ocean's 12 and Brad came up and said, hey, you want to be in a Martin Scorsese movie? Because Brad, I don't know if you know, produced that. And Brad was going to play either Leo or my role. I can't remember which one. I guess they had spoken to Marty, and Marty was like, no, I'd like to have Matt. And I thought Brad was joking. I'm like, what actor do you ask that question of? You know, you're like, shut up, man. <laughs> He's like, no, I'm actually serious. And then he handed me the script, and it was fantastic. I just felt like that was one of those things that fell from the sky. It's like Marty, it was like working with Steven, you know, with, with Spielberg. It's like, or Coppola, like, wow, I got to do that. I'll always be, you know, grateful that I had that, that, that chance. And every day, like, it was just, you know, that scene in the elevator, you know what I mean? It's just like, you just feel, it's just electric when you're doing it because, um, because you're doing it, you know, in front of Martin Scorsese. I can't wait to see you explain this to a fucking Suffolk County jury, you fucking cock. This is gonna be fucking fun. Just kill me. I am killing you.
you know, it was the, the, the gag there is that it's a total surprise. And I know I'm screwed I'm, and I'm begging for, you know, I think I'm saying just kill me. And then the door opens and, and his head gets blown off. And, and I, I remember sitting, we were sitting there, <laughs> Marty had a shot of the elevator door closing, uh, I, you know, and opening because Leo, Leo was laying across the thing, closing and opening. And like, we were sitting there and Leo and I were looking at it and it was like, no one's ever going to believe like that's Leonardo DiCaprio just got his head blown off. Like we knew that that surprise was going to was going to work. Invictus. Well, it's an incredible book and it was a great script. Alan Horn, who ran Warner Brothers at the time, called me and told me that he wanted me for this part. And so I immediately called Clint and I remember I got his uh, office. They said, uh, oh, he's not he's not here right now. And I go, OK, great. Just he can just call me back whenever. And they go, oh, that's a thing. We don't, we don't know when he's going to call because he's on vacation and nobody knows how to reach him. And when it, whenever he calls, it could be a couple days, but I'll give him your message. And I remember hanging up the phone and saying to my wife, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> like when you're at the place where you're like, I'll call you in three days because I'm with my family and I can't be bothered. I'm like, wow, that's, that was, that was kind of neat. But I just remember loving working with him. He does one take. I heard that. So I worked on that South African accent like an office job. Tim Monick, this great dialect coach, would come. And we would, from Monday to Friday, from, from 9 in the morning till 5, like, like it was an office job, we worked for about six months on that thing because I knew I was only going to get one take. And on the first day, I, I did my first take. And I knew that I, got, that I got it right. But I was like, you know, hey, boss, can I have another one? And he just turned to me and goes, why? Do you want to waste everybody's time? And I was like, all right, I guess we're moving on. <laughs> you know? So that was, that was day one with Clint. Heads up. Look in my eyes. Do you hear? Listen to your country. Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Defense, defense, defense. This is it. This is our destiny. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. He, he looks like an NFL linebacker. He's six foot five. The first time I met him, I went to his house for dinner right when I got to South Africa. And I really admired like what that team did and what he did and everything. And so I was excited to meet him. And, and I rang the doorbell and the door opened. And this guy who like took up the whole doorway, you know, opened the door. Big smile. And, and I just looked up at him and I said, I, I look much bigger on film. <laughs> Contagion. Scott Burns, our writer, just did a mountain of research and, and talked to all the experts. They explained exactly what would happen, and the movie's really accurate. It was eerie, you know, for all of us to look at it once the world started to kind of imitate the movie. You know, luckily, COVID wasn't as deadly as the virus in, uh, in our movie. You know, and for anybody who said we couldn't have predicted this and how could we have known, it's like, well, a movie came out about it 10 years before that like kind of told you everything, not because we... And if people in Hollywood have some kind of any kind of secret answers or we guessed, but because we actually just took the time to talk to experts and let them lead our story. Been working here? Just get the serum. <coughs> Jory, don't touch anything. Help me. Hey, take your gloves off. Here, give me your hands. You really rub this in. Well, Ian Lipkin, who was our technical advisor, who's, who, you know, he does for a living, he identifies viruses. And he explained that he identifies a new one every week. They're able to kind of figure out what it is. All right, this is kind of bird that, they, you know, right, and they can figure it out and stop it. But there are these kind of outbreaks that happen all over the world all the time. And you talk to that guy and like, you definitely, you know, you definitely feel like this could happen. The Martian. That was the first thing I said to Ridley Scott. I was like, I don't know if I can do this. And he was like, why? And I said, well, because I literally just played, you know, the movie Interstellar hadn't come out. And I go, it's not a big part, but I am a guy alone on a planet, you know, and I don't know if I should follow it up with the guy who's alone on a planet. Ridley, nobody gives a about that. And I was like, yeah, I'm so glad he said that to me because I took the leap and I'm really glad I did, obviously. I'm entering this log for the record. Uh, in case I don't make it, uh, it is oh six fifty three on Soul nineteen, and I'm alive. And 
obviously, but I'm guessing that's going to come as a surprise to my crewmates and to NASA and to the entire world, really. So, surprise. There was a scripted moment when the character was supposed to break down, and when we got to it, it felt forced. And Ridley and I kind of looked at each other and were like, this doesn't feel right, does it? And we both kind of felt that same, you know, we were in the same movie together. And we were like, yeah, no. And we were getting towards the end of the schedule, and I thought we were going to kind of find a new little scene to do where I'm about to, like, get reunited with my team. We'd shot stuff with the other actors months earlier, but they'd all gone home. And Ridley and I had made all those scenes just together where it was just me on camera. And so suddenly I heard in my helmet as the, you know, as the gimbal starts to shudder as if this thing is going to take off and the light effects start to happen and like, and you really feel like, you know, you're about to kind of take off. And suddenly I heard the voices of all of these actors who were my buddies, you know, and, and, it, and it dawned on me, you know, thinking through the kind of the filter of this character, like he hadn't heard a voice in a year and that these people had made this sacrifice to come back for him. About two minutes, Watney. How you doing down there? I'm good. I'm anxious to get up to you. Thanks for coming back for me. Well, we're on it. Remember, we'll be pulling some serious G, so it's okay to pass out. You're in Martinez's hands now. Well, tell that asshole no barrel rolls. <laughs> Copy that, Mav. Capcom, go. Remote command. Go. Recovery. Go. Secondary recovery. Go. Pilot. Go. They came all the way back. You know, they slingshot around Earth and come back. You know what I mean? It's like, it was so humbling. It just totally happened and it wasn't planned. That's just great directing. That's Ridley just, just kind of put a move on me. I didn't see it coming. You know, that one of those things, it's over in five minutes. That's just down to great directing. True Grit. Well, that was just the chance to work with the Coen brothers, really. And on the technical side, I was like trying to figure out the tongue thing when he gets his tongue uh, injured. And that we figured out, I was sitting in a makeup trailer one day on another movie and picked up a hair tie and just put it around my twist, started twisting it around my tongue and just tried to speak normally. And that was how we kind of came up with that little gag. But those guys are unbelievably prepared, like they storyboard everything. And now they're at the stage where despite having everything meticulously storyboarded, they don't really adhere to the storyboards anymore because they're so experienced. They can kind of, you know, if a better idea comes to them on the spot, they just kind of drive in that direction. And they, they're just, it was really, they're really efficient and just amazing. In conscience, you cannot side our agreement. You're the one who shot me. Mr. Beef has a point, Marshal. It is an unfair leg up in any competition to shoot your opposite number. Oh, damn it. I do not accept it as a given that I did shoot LeBee. There are plenty of guns going off. I heard the rifle and I felt the ball. You missed your shot, Cogburn. Missed it. my shot! You were more handicapped without the eye than I without the arm. That was great. I mean, and also doing a Western with them and with Jeff. You know, and Haley was like 13 and she was so sweet. That was another situation where Jeff and I, kind of as parents, were like very... Everyone was, I mean, to be fair, I mean, the, the, you know, everyone there was wanted to make sure that she had a good time, and I think she really did. And she's amazing in the movie, too. She was another one of those, it's like, obscenely gifted, you know, child actors. Ford versus Ferrari. It was so much fun working with him. I, ha I had a blast. He's, I mean, he's unbelievably professional. He comes at it out of a place of joy, and I'm the same way. We both love what we do. I think he's aware of his reputation as being so, you know, serious. And the very first day, the director, Jim Mangold, who's great, we got our first shot off and Jim comes running in. He's a big personality and he just launches into, okay, well you do that on that line, look at him and then, and, out, and he starts giving us these notes, but, but it's big, like it's, you know, it's, it's almost like a performance. Oh, how long has that been? Oh, it's got to be three or four years at least. Oh. I'm sorry. Yeah, SCCA Divisional Championship. You broke my finger. Oh. What's that, sir? Such a nippy, nippy bloody thing. You do yeah. it, all that thing. I call that the it's llama like, bite. He's just this bigger than life guy. He goes, all right, let's go dude. take two. And he goes running back to behind the camera and Christian just turned to me and goes, who was that guy? And I think it was his way of going like, this is gonna be fun.
we don't have to out serious one another. Because if you come at it from a place of joy and relaxation, then your work's always going to be better. You ready? The name on the middle of that steering wheel should tell you that I was born ready, Shelby. Hit it. That a boy. And the cars we drove would be the shell of a car with like a Miata engine. So I think the real cars are all in museums. We did work one day with the shell of a car and just the shell of an original Cobra it just had police tape around it. It was worth over a million dollars. It was just this, the, the most beautiful thing. But yeah, no, those real cars are something. Still water. That was one of the things I loved. It was like, because that's a very, very specific thing. A roughneck from Oklahoma that can even do that job. Most people can't do it. I couldn't do it, for sure. And so to play someone like that, transplanted to Marseille, which is a really specific city in France. It's not Paris, it's Marseille. And I just thought that it was, you know, beautifully written and the dynamics between, you know, me and my daughter, played by Abby Breslin, and then this other kind of new family that he finds. A woman he falls in love with and her daughter, her eight-year-old daughter, he suddenly has the relationship with her that he couldn't have with his own kid and all of the pain and the regret and the shame that he carries and we talk about it as kind of like a dramatic thriller. It's got kind of the bones of the, you know, the guy goes to exonerate his daughter and it, and it looks like it might be that movie and it's not. It's something very different. You're the father of the girl, the, the American student? Yes, ma'am. Allison came here for college, and that's where she met this girl, Lena. One night she found Lena dead and called the police. All they cared about was Allison sleeping with some Arab girl. She'd never acted before, and she's just one of those kids who's a natural. And you, you never know what you're going to get with a kid. And after the first day, Tom and I sat down and just said, OK, well, we got to make sure this doesn't get messed up. We have to keep this as, as fun and playful and joyful for her. French laws helped us there a bit because they're really strict about how many hours a kid can work. She never got exhausted. She never got burned out by the process, which, which can happen to adults, you know. And so when she was on set, everybody was kind of uh, all hands on deck, ready to go. She was, you know, somehow naturally just did things differently every take. Like she just couldn't do it the same way twice, which is, you know, technique that takes decades for most people to learn. Thanks a lot for watching. If you made it this far, if I missed anything, uh, then just write in the chats or whatever, however you kids do it. And uh, uh, we'll talk about it next time.